Tumblr user Anilel requested a video about the difference between serial and free atonality. So I'm the classical nerd, and let's do that. Atonality broadly is music that is not conceived with a tonal center or tonal relationships in mind. So let's say you're in D major. If you're in D major, then your home key, your tonic, is D and every note around it has a specific relation to D. So if you're writing atonally, there's absolutely no difference between the note D in and of itself and the note A-flat, which in a tonal context is as far away from D as you can possibly go. Composers writing atonally don't have to follow, in fact, oftentimes they intentionally do not follow any of the normal rules that tonal composers associated with different notes in a scale. One of the first composers to actually start thinking about atonality in this way was none other than Franz Liszt, who in the year before his death wrote a piano piece that he called a bagatelle sans tonality, a bagatelle meaning a trifle without tonality. Essentially an experiment, and today it's not considered nearly as dissonant as perhaps other atonal works, but it still avoids these particular tonal relationships, and so it can be considered, technically speaking, atonal. The trouble really is that there is absolutely no better definition for atonality than simply lacking tonality because there are so many different ways to use it. When you begin breaking things down, different kinds of atonality become markedly different. For instance, not very many people realize just how atonal Debussy can be. For when he uses his trademark whole tone scales, he's actually writing atonally. When you have a whole tone scale, there's the same space between every note, and so there's no clearly defined sense of center or going away from it. You're simply floating in a sea of whole tones. In the Russian sphere, the late works of Alexander Skriabin and the octatonic scales of Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov approached atonality. In fact, they incorporated elements of it, but they always were somewhat tonally based, although Skriabin was much less tonally based than was Rimsky-Korsakov. Atonal passages in music preceded atonal music itself, which is where Arnold Schoenberg comes in. Schoenberg saw the influx of extended harmonies and intentional ambiguity in musical structures. He saw music as simply losing a lot of the rules that held it together. And after writing an initial set of really lush late romantic pieces that took tonality as he knew it to its absolute limits, he decided to test the waters of what he called free atonality. Now, free atonality is Schoenberg really writing by the seat of his pants. He is lost in a sea of 12 notes without so much as a paddle. Now, this put emphasis on orchestration, on texture and form, all the things that don't actually have to go with what notes go where on the page. In fact, Schoenberg's most famous piece is freely atonal, his Pierrot Lunaire, from which we derive the Pierrot Ensemble. But soon afterwards, Schoenberg felt like this wasn't enough that simply breaking all the rules meant that you needed to find new rules by which to write your music. And he also felt that despite the freely atonal nature of his pieces, they were incredibly hard to write for one, and two, he kept hearing tonal relationships, as if he was using these tonal relationships without even realizing it. Now to our ears they sound completely dissonant, but Schoenberg heard these little things in there and he didn't like it, and so he set out to develop what he called the 12-tone technique. While the history and the details of the 12-tone technique are likely better suited to a separate video entirely, suffice it to say that it provided a numerological basis for equal use of all 12 notes of the chromatic scale, arranged in a pattern known as a tone row from which the entire piece was based. The 12-tone method was adapted by Schoenberg's main pupils, Alban Berg and Anton Webern. Alban Berg was best known for reintegrating Schoenberg's technique into traditional lush late romanticism for a very interesting and very unique sound world, of which his violin concerto is probably his best known work. While Anton Webern decided to go in a completely different direction, he took his mentor's words and took them as gospel. He pared down the 12-tone technique to the point where it just became random notes here and there. In fact, his collected works are so short they fit onto just a couple of CDs and some of his pieces last only a few seconds, not even a minute. Webern spent his career culling down his mentor's techniques to a brief and jagged science, and although Webern died in a tragic accident at the end of World War II, his ideas lived on, and composers from the 1950s to about the 1980s took Webern's ideas and distilled them even further. Instead of running through rows of pitches where you have to go through every single possible value before allowing yourself to go back to the beginning and repeat a note, 
They did the same thing with dynamics or with rhythm. Collectively, the process of putting music through these permutations and rows and really artificial constructions is known as serial atonality, or basically serialism as a whole. Composers who wrote nothing but serialist music didn't really seem to care all that much about how the music sounded at the end product. They were more concerned about how the music looked on paper, what sort of mathematical and intellectual rigor went into putting the notes on the page instead of the actual end result. Not to say that some composers who wrote in a 12-tone or even strictly serial style weren't able to write some beautiful music. After all, Igor Stravinsky and Aaron Copland both were able to successfully integrate 12-tone idioms into their own work late in their careers. It's just that most of the composers who wrote strictly in these styles aren't heard much in the concert halls because their music just doesn't really sound all that good. Because of such limitations, serialism has been more or less abandoned by many of the composers of this era. They're more likely to embrace free atonality, or even an idiosyncratic version of tonality, before they approach serial techniques. Although they're still taught because it's still useful for analysis and, you know, people can still use it as a tool in their compositional toolbox. When listened to, atonal music just sounds well, atonal. But serial atonality often has a sense of alien pointillism that free atonality often lacks. But regardless of what method the composer chose to use, you can pretty much bet that the result is not on any unironic easy listening playlists. Mm -hmm.